first, I just want to say, I think it's super exciting that um, this Ag Tech conference um, has become so successful and, and has been growing so fast. I think the research park has is, is been really, really influential in creating an Ag Tech community and hub here in Champaign. Um, Champaign is not that big a town, but I think it really has the promise to become a major center for innovation in agriculture. So I'm really excited to, to be part of this. Um, as Laura said, we are starting a new center on uh, the campus of the University of Illinois called the Center for Digital Agriculture, which is a joint effort between the Granger College of Engineering and the College of Agriculture with a goal of fostering new collaborative research projects between engineering and agriculture, new education programs, including a new professional master's degree program that will be online, um, and new outreach efforts to work closely with industry and, and the community. So that's something we're just getting started and I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you all more about that. But I want to switch topics and, and focus now on the panel. Um, I think it's it's probably no surprise, no, uh, not news to all of you that we are just starting to scratch the surface in terms of the potential for technology innovation in agriculture. It's a major area for transformation and the potential is huge, um, which I think makes it actually especially timely and exciting that ag tech is growing in, in, uh, in the research park. So the topic today is digital disruption in agriculture and in our view, that encompasses a wide range of different things, um, including data-driven decision-making for producers, um, which will be the main topic of today's discussion, but also other areas like genomics, um, robotics, and other aspects of automation, um, also blockchain and other technologies to track the supply chain. There's many other areas like this that are ripe for innovation. We're gonna be focusing today on data and how data can be used for, um, for decision making in agriculture. And I'm happy to say that we have um, three experts in this area on the panel today. Uh, Mark Moran is the director for the John Deere Technology Innovation Center here in Champaign in the research park. Um, um, John Rahia is the Senior Manager for Business Development uh, for F Global Fuse at ACCO. And uh, Scott Hermes is the Senior Director of Solution Delivery at Kin and Carta. And all of these people have significant expertise both in agriculture and in uh, data-driven solutions for agriculture. So I think they are the they're very good choices to give us their insights on this panel. The way this is going to work is that um, I'm going to ask each of them to answer a few questions in turn. So to just take a few minutes to address each of these questions, we just go through the panelists one by one for each question. And then I'd like to open it up to the audience and um, ask you to uh, bring up any questions that, that you would like to. You can either do it using the QR codes that were used in the previous panel, which um, I'm I'm hoping some of you at least know how to do. Um, or you're more than welcome to come up to the microphone. So there are a couple, at least a couple of microphones uh, in the room here. And I would encourage you to step up and ask questions as well. Okay, so without further ado, let me get to the first question here. And this is just to set some uh, context for the questions. I'd like to ask each of the panelists um, to say what aspects of the topic, what aspects of data-driven decision-making in agriculture is the main focus at their company and what their customers in particular are most interested in. Um, so if we can start with that, Mark. Sure, okay. Is, uh, you hear is the microphone on? It's great when you're a technology panel and you have problem <laughs> with uh, 20th century yes. technologies. Great. Technology yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> right on. Okay. Uh, for, for Deer, you know, we're focused on what's happening in, in the fields and we're focused on supporting those equipment operations. Some of those data driven decisions are happening in real time and the, the equipment is more and more able to do that on behalf of uh, growers. And then, of course, many of those decisions are made in the planning season, and we've got a rich set of technologies that support that as well. Um, yes, hey, thanks. So, uh, John are here. Uh, so, at Agco Corporation, we're um, you know in, in a similar business as John Deere, right? So, we have some similar um, 
some similarities around the what, how we approach uh, data-driven innovation as well. Um, but really, we we focus on the entire crop cycle and how we can engage in each specific point across the crop cycle and, and take innovations and you know automate the um, um, bits and pieces of that to make the the grower or operator's life easier at every step along the way, and then you know pulling this all together in a um, you know off-season planning type mechanism to take their feedback, take what's important to them, help them you know make their operations more efficient, and then sort of feedback that uh, through the whole crop cycle the next go round. Yeah. Hi, so I'm Scott Harms. I'm from Ken and Carta, uh, formerly Solstice, as you can see from my uh, rebranding here. I know no one else in the room has gone through a rebrand at all. So you're not familiar with that, but this is what's <laughs> happening. Um, so basically what we do, I'm sort of the odd man out here, is uh, we're a software services firm. So we help uh, great companies build great products that really amaze their customers, right? So we're digital products. So we'll come on in uh, to companies uh, that have great science, great technology, and they have uh, customers with problems, and we help them connect with those correctly. So in specifically in the ag tech field, I've been personally involved over the last two and a half years, and I know earlier panelists have talked about this, people coming from outside in. Um, it's a great space to be in. The impact you make is unbelievable, and that the combination of physical and digital is really inspiring as a technologist to really see the impact that you have. Um, as our company as a whole has been working in the ag tech field probably around, I think, six years was probably our first um, engagement. Um, and so what we really do is we focus on in terms of the specific topic is um, if you take data-driven decisions. So that could, for us could mean anything from um, are we getting the right inputs to understand are we solving the right problem? So we use user research to go out in the field, right? And then we, whatever products we make, we instrument with analytics to make sure are people using the products in the right way at the tactical level, right? And then over the broader sense, um, we help people understand the science that these great companies have and help them understand and give them that information at the right time to make the right decision. So we don't overwhelm them, we give them just enough information in the right time to make the right decision. Great, so <coughs> time to get technical. <laughs> I'd like to ask now, what do you see as the most promising technology innovations that are going to drive this area forward? What do you think is going to make decision-making, data-driven decision-making in agriculture um, go from where it is today, which is sort of a promising but just a uh, burgeoning field, to something that can become really uh, dominant or, or, or a major way to practice agriculture? Where will, what technology innovations do you think are going to be most impactful? I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start, I'll suggest just a couple. I think it's obvious in this context that AI is, is you know, the, the, the most obvious answer, right? But let's dig into that a tiny bit. I, I think there's a lot of really interesting trends where, uh, and, and sometimes you'll hear the term tiny AI used to describe this, where, you know, the amount of decisions that your smartphone can make now, that's a, that's a pretty small computational footprint that you can put out in the field on, on, on equipment that has to go through really rough duty cycles like ours. And that's really, really exciting that it doesn't necessarily have to go back to the cloud. At the same time, and maybe I'm almost gonna contradict myself now, if you think about 5G coming and uh, what that does to really make you not have to worry about that anymore, the ability to get a whole lot of bandwidth with very little latency wherever you are, then you just, then it's just a, you know, a computing and decision-making fabric that, that we haven't had in the past. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, so I would um, echo part of that, right? So the, the edge computing, um, the ability to do more things in the field without having to go back to a cloud or a server um, and make those decisions immediately and then sort of feed that back into the operation as you're going through the field. You know, we see some of that already with precision planning and other um, solutions out in the marketplace. And I think that ability is going to continue to grow and grow and, and companies will um, sort of latch on to that ability and, and build really cool things on top of it. Um, so that's one exciting area. I think, you know, we've talked about some of the hyperledger and, and that type of um, technology that's coming through and, and we're all still probably trying to figure out how best we can implement it into our industry. I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, you know, companies like ours are still trying to figure out how best to, to bring that in and, and use it effectively to, you know, build traceability or transparency into, into the operation. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, those are two things. There, there's tons, right? It's, and it's all about how, with all these different innovations and technologies that are out there that we 
sort of bring them in, work together as an industry and, and you know, together across functions within the company to provide solutions that are easy to use for the customer, um, simple, intuitive, and you don't have five different things doing very similar you know, type um, operations for the customer and they're just confused and, and don't you know, have to proceed right because that'll hurt adoption and ultimately hurt the ability to, to build on top of what we have going right now. So you made me very happy because edge computing is 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 one of the main research areas in my own group. So I didn't, but but it wasn't planted. I swear. <laughs> Scott. Yeah, I definitely agree with the, both those. I think um, we're already seeing uh, edge computing on the phone. Right, we can do uh, Tensor ML uh, uh, on the phone. We can do object recognition. Um, I, I think, and I was, I was really excited to hear uh, from Cargill. Keith, the hearing about talking about bringing in a hyperledger technology, and also more importantly, opening up the idea of building an open data sharing platform. I think any any work along that line is really going to hugely accelerate any work you're trying to do with machine learning and AI because your outputs are only good as your inputs. And so right now you have a highly fragmented uh, data scene out there where people are you know potentially some of their information's in John Deere Cloud, maybe some of it's um, with Corteva, maybe you know who knows exactly where your data, maybe it's on pieces of paper. But the bringing that all together in a consistent view, along with the edge computing, and it's really also exciting to hear about a new set of sensors uh, being displayed, right? So we all know that um, you know, trying to accurately predict you know, precipitation on your field is hyper-local, right? And so if you are going off of a weather station that's even a half a mile or two miles away, it's not going to be as accurate as a sensor on your field. And as the prices of those come down, it'll improve the input of the data coming in. But you still need sort of a consistent area to collect and share that. And so I think that's where something, again, it's, it's not necessarily even a technology, but it's more of a cultural change in how people are collaborating, right? So can we as competitors learn how, what information we can share, what platforms we can share to better serve our customers? Okay, so I think I heard tiny AI or the ability to do AI near, at the edge near the sensors and sensor data, uh, 5G as a, as a communication substrate or technology to make data accessible at, at very low latencies and high bandwidths, um, edge computing as a way to do computing near sensors, blockchain and, and smart ledger kinds of technologies, um, and data-driven integ or data integration and deployment. Did I miss anything? You get an A, Professor. I'm sorry, what? You get an A. You got it all. <laughs> got it right. <laughs> Bingo. <laughs> okay, so one of the biggest challenges in this area is getting these kinds of technologies adopted, especially really advanced technologies in, in a domain like agriculture, which is very cost, cost sensitive, very, very driven by um, the need to feed a large population, but would be... Uh, where, where disruptive change is not something you can really deploy um, overnight because you have to be, be able to sustain production at large enough scales to be feeding a, a large population. It seems these kinds of technologies can be hard to, to get accepted. So what do you each see as the biggest obstacles for uh, getting these kinds of advanced technologies adopted in data-driven uh, agriculture? And you can go in the same order. Sure, I'll 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 say uh, uh, sometimes um, as a, a, I think the oldest company on the stage and maybe the oldest company in the room, uh, <laughs> sometimes we are our own biggest obstacle. If we're going to be fully transparent, right? Yes. There's you know the 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 risk of uh, uh, the risk of failure when you have a successful business. Sometimes you can kind of start to trip over yourself. Yep. So, but that's our job as technologists to help mm -hmm. to help communicate that story, and I think that it, that that can be one big barrier. Um, Professor, you're right. The, the farmers just sam simply cannot get it wrong. They can't have a single bad season. Right. Um, so that that barrier for success is is high, and and maybe I don't think you you asked for a, a solution, but I'll offer one. Don't deploy it first in agriculture. <laughs> uh, find find a way to learn and buy down the risk elsewhere because mm -hmm. uh, farmers are very, very, very savvy businessmen. And once they understand the value, they will adopt technology. Think about all of the technology we've seen in recent decades. Once the value prop is clear, they'll jump on board. So just learn somewhere else and make it more obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, you know, a good point that these 
farmers only have, you know, 40 or 50, depending on how long they work, chances at getting it right. So um, they're very, you know, they're tech savvy and they're good business people, but they're hesitant to um, sort of go blindly into some solution that they've never tested, never seen the, um, uh, the value for firsthand, you know, again, going back to precision planning a little bit with our crop tours, it's, you know, it's a long-term approach to proving the value of these new technologies to the farmers and showcasing, you know, the old versus the new or the potential of this adoption and what it can provide to you and showing it firsthand where it's tangible. Um, you know, so taking those approaches of education um, help sort of break down some of those um, barriers of, of adoption. Another you know, thing sort of mentioned earlier, but it's um, sort of this simplicity and, and how do we make um, these solutions that are intuitive and easy to use and, and take as much of the human interface out, but allowing that engagement to still be there. Nobody wants just to be told what to do, but to be informed of what they should do. And then, you know, they make the decision themselves, but it's it's sort of minimizing the risk of, mm -hmm. of making that decision. So um, the more we can provide solutions that are intuitive and, and simple and provide these actual insights, the, the faster we'll adopt. And, um, you know, so I think it's for all these different companies doing these different approaches to, to technology and innovation and agriculture, you know, we're all trying to, to get two or three dollars per acre from this farmer that's already under financial pressure. So it's something we'll have to grow out of as an industry, but how do we simplify this offering and, and work better together versus a very disjointed offering to the, to the farmer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely echo that. I mean, uh, like I said, I'm a relative newcomer to ag tech, and previous to this, I was involved a lot in finance. And one of the uh, projects I worked with is a large uh, private bank, and this idea of a family office, and then so it's a it's a group of people who are trying to you know manage wealth over generations. And so I was really struck by once I came to ag, like how a lot of similar to those things are. This idea of really the uh, growers really do see their land as uh, something they probably got from their family and want to <laughs> hand it on to their family. But again, as someone brought up earlier, a lot of the younger people are moving on to other ventures, but still nonetheless, there's the sense of investment in the land that goes back to don't run an experiment on you know, my most treasured asset. I, this is all I have. Um, so I think really uh, going back out and, and really try to listen first and not come out and sort of you know, tell people, hey, we have all the science, we're absolutely right, we're gonna tell you why you're wrong but more try to understand where they're coming from and then build the trust and then they'll be more ready to accept it. And the other idea that I think is interesting and that I, I saw another parallel between is just like in any uh, you know, investment portfolio, right? You have different areas of risk and different areas of growth. And I think most growers are sort of open to that idea of like, okay, this is untested. We're gonna come in with you together on this. We're like, we'll, we'll co-invest on this area. We're running some experiments and we definitely see, you know, at least in my experiences so far in the field, I've seen where uh, companies have had success where they take that sort of collaborative view as opposed to we're just going to go you know, ram this down your throat. So I, I just want to follow up on, on a couple of points you made. So yes, um, trying a technology out for the first time in agriculture is not a great idea. That th There's very good reasons for, for not doing that. But what is the right thing for startups to do? So are there technology areas or directions or advice you would have for a company that wants to come in and start something relatively new or start at a, at a small stage? Um, part of the point of this conference is to service the entrepreneur and, and investor community and give them um, advice or give them opportunities to think about directions to pursue. What kind of advice would you have for entrepreneurs or investors in, uh, to, to start something successful in this area? I think uh, Dennis really nailed it earlier when we had the previous panel up talking about investors. Uh, you know, you, you talk to customers and then you talk to customers and then you talk to customers again. Mm -hmm. And uh, in doing that, you learn what really matters to them. You build some trust. Yeah, that, that idea of uh, can we do a small experiment together? That's absolutely viable if you do it the right way. Also incubator environments, incubator and now accelerator environments like this have lots and lots of tools to help uh, increase your knowledge and buy down the business risk for everyone. So yep. just, you know, move fast to get customer knowledge, spend as little as you can to get to that point, learn as much as you can and pivot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing to add is being at the University of Illinois and, and the partnerships that you can get with universities and sort of academia to, to prove your concept and, and to understand where you're failing and, and, and bridge those gaps and build it up to a point where then you can take it to a, you know, a customer or someone to, to do some tests out in the real world and the real farms and understand the feedback you can get from them too. So taking this, you know, speed is something we need to be, you know, aware of, but at the same time, you should take the steps to, um, you know, make sure you're, you're dotting all your I's and you're, you're testing out all the theories before you actually go live in any sort of test with, with actual customers and then learn from that and build on it and then get mm -hmm. to a point where you can scale it out. Yeah. Uh, yeah spot on, echo those things. Um, just make sure that you're, you know, solving a problem that needs to be solved, right? Not just sort of sure. coming with a solution, looking for a problem, get that feedback early, and right. then increase the, the size of the experiment that you do. Okay, I have one more question and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so we are at a university after all, and education is one of the main things that we do here. So my question for you is, what education gaps do you think universities should try to address to make this area succeed? Are there things that we as a university could do that need to be done in order for data-driven uh, decision-making in agriculture to succeed in the future? And this includes education for workforce people like your companies, but also for the producer, the growers, in the growing, uh, the producer community. I'll start here, just um, a couple of thoughts. I mean, it's sort of the same thing we need to do as a, at Agco internally, right? It's we need to break down the, the different silos and work cross-functionally now to, to bring in, mm -hmm. um, you know, data scientists with the, the product people, with product engineers, product management, with, uh, you know, the people out in the field to understand the customers. And so break down those silos and really have this um, sort of joint effort to solve the problems. The same thing that needs to happen at universities where, um, you know, the ag school and the computer science school and the engineer school, um, you know, joint degrees and that's things that's already being worked on on together now here at the University of Illinois and, and at other schools as well. So um, having that cross disciplinary uh, engagement really is, is one great step to bring in people to the job market that are um, sort of ready to jump in and understand multiple dimensions of the problems they face, not just the technical solution or the business solution or or whatever and, and sort of the other side is um you know bridging the corporate versus academic world and and so focusing on real world problems with corporations and together understanding what are the major challenges that these um, industries are facing and and you know working on white papers and solutions and then but taking that next step of how do we sort of get something going with these corporates to, to get it out into the marketplace and get it working and you know, all, all things that are sort of being done now, but I think with this sort of interesting pivot in, in the agriculture world where we're uh, moving to, uh, you know, something that hasn't been really the core of agriculture, right? Is this technology innovation or tech, technological data science type world. Uh, it's really important for us to sort of cross all those functions and, and bring that knowledge into this industry. Yep. Scott, John, anything to add? Yeah, I'd like to yeah, definitely add on to that is um, in addition to sort of bringing together specifically for ag tech, like the tech and the agriculture, I think there's a need for, um, you know, students to be more broadly trained, uh, uh, things sort of outside of their area. So specifically, I feel like communication skills uh, and narrative, right? So you can have the best idea in the world, but if you're not able to convince people or explain, you know, why it's great, um, you're not going to succeed. Same thing, the ability to be empathetic, to sort of go out and understand and interact with people. Like software is written by people for people in the end, right? Like even machine to machine communication, there's some human at the end who's gonna consume that. And if you don't understand, you know, how people work or how to talk to people, then you're, you're not gonna have as much success as if you do. So to me, that's like the turbo power, superpower that you can add on to whatever technical skill, whatever you know, data science skills that you have, is the ability to sort of understand people, um, how to work with them, and then how to solve their problems. Mm -hmm. I think maybe I'd add a couple of things. Uh, Scott and John, you both got it. Just uh, agree with everything you said. Um, there's, a, I think, kind of a, a notion in engineering that uh, a lot of the modern notions around systems engineering flow from Aero Astro, but 
ag engineers are really the original systems engineers, right? Had to integrate complex technologies for a long, long time. Uh, we need to amp that up. We need to get more formal in recognizing those systems engineering practices in agriculture. Um, and I, I think the other important thing to recognize is uh, all of these problems will continue to be team sports. There is not mm -hmm. a single person that can contain all of this in their head to solve the problems worth solving. So uh, th this university does a great job at working multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary from the CS plus X programs um, to all of the, the heavy lifting that happens at the institutes and the centers. Um, and it seems that we're on a trajectory to do more and more of that within the, the, the degree programs. And I think that's, in, that's important um, and, and a good and necessary step. Okay, great. So we, I am told that we have five questions that have been already submitted. And so I'd like to move to the audience part here. We'll start with the questions that have been submitted online, but I'd also like to encourage people who have not submitted yet to step up to a microphone and ask a question if, you're, if you'd like to. Just raise your hand and we'll call on you. But let me start with uh, one of the questions online. Okay, and if you would rather ask your question in person, you've already submitted it, we'll take that as well. Yes. But um, the first question we received was, how important is data from in-ground sensors, such as soil moisture or nutrients, to the whole data set farmers and your company uses for farm management? And that was a little bit discussed earlier by you, Vikram, as well, of the thought about sensors in the ground. Yes. How important are sensors in the ground, soil health, soil moisture, for this kind of data-driven decision-making? I'll take, a, I'll, I'll take a start at that. Uh, absolutely important to have that, you know, literal ground truth in these cases. Ab absolutely important. Difficult to get. No pun intended. Um, right, right. Well, maybe intended. <laughs> maybe pun intended, actually. Yeah. Um, I think the, the combination of a few fixed points of high fidelity um, mixed with some other, you know, lower fidelity, broader coverage. You know, there's a, a lot of math that's beyond me. Uh, that lets you stitch those things together really, really, really powerfully. So that, that continues to be an important source of data, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we're still continuing to work on how we integrate this in and do a better job of providing actionable insights off of that data, right? And it's gonna, mm -hmm. as these sensors become easier to, um, you know, cheaper, really, to get into the ground and to use that data, then, um, you know, we'll have the more ability to start doing analytics on top of it and understand, you know, what is the potential really for it. And I think we know a lot, a lot of hypothesis. We're already seeing some things out there being uh, integrated. Of it. It's super important for us to understand how we can, um, you know, continue to leverage this and provide the value that the customer is looking for and the decisions they want to make provide that insight to it. And, you know, going back to precision planning, right, it's not an in-ground sensor necessarily, but it's monitoring on the go the, the soil composition, the organic matter, um, and then making decisions on the fly off of that. So it just shows the potential that the more and more we can uh, develop out and, and get mm -hmm. this insight in, and the smarter we can be in the decisions we make off of it. Okay. Scott, anything to add? Yeah, no, I agree 100%. I mean, it's, uh, I guess to Mark's point too, I mean, there are very smart people who are built sort of algorithms around to sort of handle the fuzziness of if you don't have a sensor in the ground, because right now the costs are prohibitive. Um, but as those costs come down, we'll get, it'll get better data, it'll get more accurate. Um, but I still think that there's, you know, there's value in um, the information that is out there um, if you understand that it's only going to be accurate to a certain degree, right? And then you can still make decisions. You may not have all the information that you have need at that time, or but you'll have enough that you can make a better educated decision than if you didn't have them. So I think it's a it's a dual race. Like the the algorithms are improving, but the better data you have, then the more effective the algorithm can be. So are you finding the soil sensors to be accurate enough, or do you think that the bottleneck is is the accuracy of the soil sensors as opposed to let's say having extensive uh, numbers of sensors or scalability. Where, where do you think the bottleneck really is? For me, I think it's the scalability and the number of sensors and the number of things that you can then, you might have pockets of areas now that you're able to, to do yeah. really advanced stuff, but if you get out of the specific soil type you're, you're using or you're <laughs> analyzing there and move into um, really anywhere else in the world that you don't have this um, ability, the connectivity to, to drive this, then, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't do anything with it, right? So it's it's scale. It's it's how do we 
broaden the reach of these and then yeah. build on top of you know the data that we can ingest. Yeah. Good. Mark, what are you going to say? I think maybe especially where you have historical data. Uh, historical we have a historical understanding of how fields performed. Yeah. Um, you know uh, I would rather have more lower fidelity sensors mm -hmm. than fewer higher fidelity right. sensors, especially right. if I've got history. Yep. I think you can build a, a richer model because you can control for the you yep. can control for the error. And if the you know uh, you want to believe that the error balances out. Yep. Uh, so I'd, I'd so historical data can allow you to correct for for yep. lower fidelity yep. sensors. That makes sense. We have a question in the audience. I'm going to alternate between audience questions and the online questions. Todd Gleason, Farm Broadcaster. And if I can ask, please introduce yourself, I think. I'm sorry? If you don't mind, say your name and your affiliation. Yes, Todd Gleason, Farm Broadcaster, Illinois Extension. Uh, clearly, producers, agricultural producers, farmers, have adopted technology very quickly over time. Uh, GMO technology in the mid-90s is a really good example, GPS. Those are a couple of local ones. However, when you're talking about modernizing the value chain, it's the other end of the value chain, the consumer that seems to be the difficult problem and I'm wondering how you can translate zeros and ones into and I think the companies are actually looking for some social good that they can give to the producer so they'll buy right or the consumer so they'll buy how can you transition uh, those zeros and ones you're talking about the data into a social good that the consumer will buy and consequently that places like coca-cola which hasn't really been very has been very active, but hasn't said, you know, field to market works. Mm -hmm. Actually, they said it doesn't work, right? And said no. So how do you transition that? How do you get that zero and one to the other end with a social good that consumers will purchase? I think for, for us, we were maybe not the first to realize how much, um, how much the goals of precision farming, you know, doing doing more with less really is a sustainability story. And that's what a lot of this technology amounts to, right? When we're, when we're very carefully managing inputs, uh, that's a great sustainability story. And it, it does really resonate with, uh, does really resonate with customers. You, you still have to do something that makes sense for them financially, but I, I think the story's there. We just have to help, we just have to help recognize that as an industry, we are turning a corner towards a much more sustainability kind of a journey? It's a great question, Todd. Yeah, it, it is a great question. I think there's a opportunity now coming up with, especially CRISPR technology, right? So it's gonna be another form of genetic modification for the industry to sort of get out ahead of the story now, right? Sort of say, what, what, what are the consumers concerned about and how does this technology help them rather than us telling them how this technology is good for them, right? I think part of it is also, uh, how do you build up trust as well, right? So there's a feeling of, and, and again, that just happens over time and exhibited. Um, and another one someone also brought up earlier was, um, uh, so lab meat, right? I think that's gonna be another huge breakthrough to make sure that if you're able to do it, will people eat it, you know? So again, it's getting out, talking to people, making sure you understand where they're coming from as opposed to um, just promoting some, they don't, feel like you're just promoting something to make a profit, but that you're actually making a profit and helping the planet or and looking after their health. Online Good. question? Yeah. Question from a senior data scientist at Cargill asking about disruptions that are happening from climate change and geopolitical scenarios, and I might add coronavirus to that now, or other things that are making it more difficult to have a resilient value chain. Can we use technology that you're touching to, to improve that? Can we use technology to improve resilience to climate change and other environmental impacts? I mean, just simply, I think we'll have to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the technology that everybody in this room is really interested in is is all about sustainability and you know, sort of answering the, the other question. Um, it's it's really around. Um, you know, how can we use all these new innovations and technologies to make you know, every part of, you know, for us, the crop cycle and the, the grain storage and, and, and protein production, how can we improve every single part of that? But then you expand that to the whole supply chain when, within ag, right? And how can we make it easier for consumers to be 
um, you know, aware or traceability and understand where their food's coming from and confident in, in the ability of, of, you know, what they're eating is what they think they're eating and, and just building that um, sort of education and, and buy into this whole precision um, farming industry as we build it up. And so I think, you know, there's 100% the ability to uh, improve our supply chain um, using all these, these data-driven, um, you know, innovations. And, uh, you know, there's, I think, a, a ton of different ways to do that. And, and we'll probably all work together to make sure they get, in, you know, in, in, uh, out in the market. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I guess my thought on that is, you know, the supply chain, at least as I'm looking at it, has been optimized for cost and hasn't really been optimized for resiliency, right? So it's more like a systems problem that if we think resiliency is important, right, you want to have redundant systems in a, in a supply chain, then you can do that, but it's going to affect cost, right? So it's just like now that people are sort of seeing some of the shortcomings of optimizing, you know, that's our, there's one, again, outside of this industry, but there's basically one place in the world that makes the chips that power all of our devices. Right, and so now that we can't possibly get to them for a while, or that flow might be disrupted, we say, "Oh, well, maybe that's a problem now." Right, and so, so I think that there's, you know, it's more: are we optimizing our systems for the outcomes? And I think that yeah, it's definitely a, a good call out that as, um, you know, our system, our the external systems, weather gets less predictable, then we have to start reimagining our delivery systems to make sure that they can be more resilient and more predictable, but it might be more expensive. I'll add a couple things first, since that was a question from Cargo. Uh, I want to say, Cargo, welcome to the park. We're glad to have you here. And I hope all the other ag tech companies keep coming. Um, uh, and then related to the notion of, of resiliency, um, of course, agreeing with my, my colleagues here, I, I'd add a couple of things. Um, there are things that we can do to, I think there's two things we have to do. We have to help growers um, have better data so they can make the best possible decisions. And then we have to keep giving them better tools uh, so that they have more control over their agronomic processes. Uh, some of those tools have come from, uh, from genetics to make more, uh, more drought resistant uh, seeds. Some of those tools are very 20th century technologies like more horsepower so, and, and four wheel drives so that you can get in the field in more adverse conditions. And you know, that's where precision agriculture isn't just about information technology, it's about being able to do the right thing in the right place at the right time. And, and so all of those tools are required to, to help give customers control against these larger forces. Okay, excellent. Uh, one from Climate Corp, oh, oh, we got a, person, a question in the audience. live one. Let me go to that yeah. one Oh, hi, I'm Zulfikar Ali, uh, Director of Software Development with Ellingson Companies. So for the last 50 years, we're uh, helping farmers to manage their water label in their farms. We're recently venturing into IOUT, the Internet of Underground Things, the sensors we're talking about. So the question I have is uh, very generic. So the software, the ag tech industry is getting very crowded, but the adoption rate is very low. So do you have any suggestions uh, for the startups in here in the room? What are things we can do to increase adoption for the products we're developing? Thanks. How can startups improve adoption? We did address that briefly, but if you can take that question one more time. I don't know if I would, I mean, if, I think maybe uh, adoption of almost industry really, really takes time. I, I, I guess when I think about all the adoption of digital technologies in ag, I, I wouldn't have thought it was low. I mean, look at, uh, uh, you know, look at all the variable rate technologies that are just essential now. Absolutely essential. Um, one of the things we report on every quarter now is how many uh, how many acres of data we have in our ops center. It's a it's a very large number, right? 160 million acres of data, um, 105 of which are in the U.S. Uh, farmers will use technology once the business case is there. They'll do it. Um, it, it so you Sorry. know you have to maybe your capital needs to be. I think a part of it is is training your capital on how patient to be. Dennis did a nice job addressing that uh, earlier this morning as well. Um, I, I think you know that life cycle from fundamental technology to adoption is always longer than startups <laughs> want, right? That's always a long window. But it, so I guess I'm not sure that I see that farmers are slow to adopt. Mm -hmm. I think it was a similar thing that was brought up earlier too, is what's your 
what's your risk to reward ratio on your technology? Like how much better is it than what they're currently doing, right? Is it a, is it a 2X, is it 1.2, right? You're not gonna get a lot of traction unless there's significant benefit for them disrupting what they've done. By the way, I love the name, Internet of Underground Things. Laura? So from Climate Corp, what return on your investment are you expecting to justify your R&D budget? Good question for Mark, maybe. How much of this is creating new value in ag that you can share in versus shifting value from other components in ag? Pass. <laughs> it's yours, John. Well, we'll need to consult with the CFO. Um, no, I think it's, uh, you know, we don't have a particular number, at least not that we're talking about, but um, really it's the, the fundamentals in, in the precision ag and smart farming and, and digital solutions is um, they're great. Uh, and they can be really, they can broaden the value or increase the value across the entire value chain, right? We, again, going back to what we heard earlier around the, the farmer's um, sort of struggles really with, with the income is if we don't make our farmers more profitable, then um, you know none of the companies in here are going to thrive. Right? Everybody needs to thrive in order. So our, our solutions need to deliver that increased income and profitability to them, and and ultimately, um, you know, that's sort of what we're going for uh, as we develop these sort of digital uh, precision ag type of, of solutions. Right? And so. Um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know how in depth to go here, but uh, really, it's they are, uh, um, you know, they're, they're unique. Is that they're not just iron and, and steel, and the cost of goods going into these type of solutions make it, uh, you know, enable us to to spread that value across the entire you know, supply chain or, or industry. Excuse me, industry. I will add something. I, I, obviously, we're not going to talk about you know a, a percent return. Um, I think maybe what I would add is I, I don't know that that's the metric that an R and D leader should really be uh, worried about. Um, for us, it's about velocity. It's not about return. I'm worried about moving fast. I'm worried about getting to understanding the opportunity fast, and uh, and, and then you figure out you make the math work. You know, uh, your 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 senior leadership's going to establish what they think is the right R and D budget. Your job as an R and D leader is to convince them that they should be spending more because you're leaving great opportunities on the table, and you'll do that by converting knowledge to product faster. Okay, this is not a live question, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we have plenty on on the computer, so. Okay, so we've got a question um, about a recent digital disruption that caused a stir in the producers about in the ag space. How do you see data ownership protection concerns being addressed in future projects or applications? Data protections? Data protections and the, the concerns of data breaches that this, this is coming from a farm manager. I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, first, I, I think Deer is very proud of its its story on, on data ownership. You can go to deer.com slash trust and, and read our policy. It's very transparent, very straightforward. I, I think there are, um, I think all of the companies in this room can do everything right, and this is still a really tricky issue. Data privacy for something large enough to see from space is really hard to manage. Um, it, as long as satellites are flying over your land, there are lots of things that people can know about it, and we can't fix that. That's a larger systemic problem that is not within the ag tech segment. Um, I, I, I think uh, we have learned, and, and, and I suspect this is true for all, all of my colleagues, that you, know, you have to work hard to earn and maintain the trust of your customers, and, and doing that by being responsible stewards of their data is absolutely critical. But we will do everything right we can, and that's still not enough. Yeah, I mean, from our side, it's 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 very similar, right? We're we're um, very cognizant of, of data privacy and ownership, and make sure that we're um, you know we're building the trust with our customers, and we're using their data as we've talked about with them, and, and described that you know this is what we're going to do with your data, and this is all we're going to do with your data, and you know this is. You know, you have the opportunity to let us use it or not, right? And we think fundamentally the benefits of 
aggregating this data and being able to do analytics on top of it and get insights out of a larger pool of data is, is super important and it's the only way we'll be able to, to really drive um, you know, this industry forward when you talk about data-driven disruption and solutions, but at the same time, if, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's up to our customers with how they want to engage with, uh, with us when it comes to their data. Yeah, I think it's basically a really difficult problem to solve, right? Like it's, uh, you know, as pointed out, like the, it's, in some ways it's public data because it can be seen from the sky and then other, it's difficult to anonymize, right? So you can't, if you wanted to try to have people like self-reporting on like a pest infestation to sort of start tracking its flow, I mean, you know whose field that is. It's not like an anonymous field, right? Everybody knows everybody's field, right? So it's it's very difficult to say, uh, you know, I can take this data in, yet share it out somehow, but yet remain anonymous. It can't be done. So I think the key thing is the, the very first thing that was said was, can you build trust? Can you make it clear how you're using the data and then who gets as much as you can let the owner of the data control that data and understand how you're using it in a clear, simple way, um, that'll go a long way to building that trust. Maybe a question for John here. Um, an audience member asked, there's a lot of discussion about applying these technologies for crop production. What about for animal facilities and animal ag? Same apply, different technologies? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh very much so, right? The, the, within AGCO, we're uniquely positioned across the entire ag value chain, uh, including sort of the grain storage and then the protein side. And, uh, you know, it's been touched on a little bit earlier today. Um, but yeah, animal health and, and yeah, there's a million different sort of data points you can pull off to bring in, you know, animal health and tracking and optimizing, uh, optimizing the shrimp feeding uh, to make sure we're, we're not wasting uh, a feed there. So uh, all across the, um, the animal pr production, is, there's a, a ton of different opportunities to leverage uh, data and advanced analytics and advanced technologies to improve the animal welfare, the production side, uh, the cost side for the producer. So it's, uh, there's a lot of value and opportunity there. Yep. I'm told we have just a couple of minutes left, is that right? Yeah, go ahead. Let's take one more question at least. But. I'll do one more, but I'll say we're going to have Teddy from Lando Lakes speaking on broadband later. Molly Hammond from USDA asks, asks about broadband access and how this is a challenge in rural broadband access to adopt technologies. So I'm just giving an early plug that he is the FCC chairman for rural broadband initiatives and ag in infrastructure. So is rural broadband an obstacle, and what is the situation like for rural broadband today? Connectivity is absolutely a limiting factor. There's, there's, no, doubt about, there's no doubt about that. What the right solution is, we have to figure out. But uh, you, know, you look at all those uh, blank spots on those coverage maps, those are farms, right? Uh, our system was built for urban use. Um, that's absolutely a, a limiting factor, and, and you know, so there's... Um, there's only so much compute you can put out on the edge, and and sometimes today things need to come back, need to come back home to a, to a larger infrastructure. I don't presume what the right solution is, but it's absolutely a limiting factor for customers and, and something that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we build a lot of uh, mobile apps, and uh, it's a huge problem, right? And so from from day one, we had to understand a what's the performance to make sure that the apps work well um, in low bandwidth situations. And it's difficult because, we're well, not difficult, but it's, it's hard, not always top of mind for our developers because we're, you know, we're based out of Chicago. They're used to sort of constantly having, you know, nonstop Wi-Fi, nonstop connectivity. And when they don't have Wi-Fi, it's a major crisis and no one can work. So um, they don't really get the idea of that. There might be places in the world where you, your phone suddenly won't work. Or if you walk into a large, you know, concrete building, suddenly you won't have that signal and then building apps that can be resilient. In other words, that you know, we, as we, when we have a data connection, we're pulling data down, and then we're storing the important bits locally, and then as we get more information, right? So we really had to put a lot of thought into you know, how we're doing uh, you know, caching and, and allowing people to continue to use the app 
um, when it's offline and then sync back up, right? So there's definitely, there's a ton of technologies out there that can, that can help you do that, but it's, it's thinking about, again, this goes back to one of our key things, which is like empathy for the user, right? What world do they live in? Mm -hmm. So you can get around lack of connectivity, but not if you don't think about it from the first thing that when you start to design your solution. Okay. I think with that, we should call it a panel. I want to thank the panelists one more time for agreeing to participate and for their insights. Um, they will all, I think, be available for some more time if you have more questions for them. Um, I will also be here and, and happy to chat one more time. But thank you all very much. <laughs>